As we begin this new year, uh, are you hopeful? What's the option? Hopeful or hopeless, right? If you could just look up here, right? Are you hopeful? Really, really want to ask you. Ask your soul if you're hopeful or kind of like you don't want to get out of bed, right? I've been there many days. Don't want to get out of my bed. Just don't have any adrenaline, you know? Uh, just kind of pumping in me for me to get out of bed and go to work or go to studies or whatever. But how do you feel right now? I really want to ask you this question because if I were to say to you, there is hope for your future, you would say, who are you, right? Is your word trustworthy? Right? Anybody could say that, like, but this is not just anybody, right? Jeremiah 31, verse 1 says, There is hope for your future, declares the Lord. It's not just anybody. It's different, okay? I think, if you think about it, every single one of you, without exception, any, uh, the people in this world cannot live without hope. You could live without certain luxurious things, but without hope, you cannot go on. You cannot. Just think about it. And uh, what is hope then? You know, what is hope? It is your desire and expectation of now toward the future and hoping that it'll come to fruition or fulfillment. Let me repeat that because it's really important. Hope affects you now because you can't live without it, but it is about the future. Whether what you desire will be fulfilled in the future or not. Give you an example. Will I get this job? Will I get into this program? Will I get into this program? That's future, but it affects you now. If you're hopeful, you will be energetic. You'll be hopeful. We call that optimistic right? If you are hopeless, you'll be so drained, right? So drained. Amazing thing is, hope is about the future, and it, it, it affects now. Every single one of us. It affects me, it affects you. I'm very hopeful for this year. I am. Can you tell? Right? Usually you could tell. When you look at your neighbors, you could tell whether that person is hopeful or cynical and pessimistic and downcast, right? So I want to give uh, this as an introduction because every single one of you will, it's just a must. You cannot live without a hope, okay? So let's talk about hope. There's hope for your future, declares the Lord, and that's the verse that Lord gave to this church. In fact, to his people thousands of years ago to his people, not just anybody, to his people, okay? And I uh, put a second title, okay? And I ask you to look at it, Born Again, Living Hope, okay? Which kind of implies that not born again, pretty much not hopeful, okay? That's the biblical position. Okay, that's the biblical position. Okay, so the first question I would like to ask you is what psalmist asked, not the latter half of the, of, of the verse, but the first half of the verse. It says, so where do I put my hope? Where do you put your hope? Okay, where do you put your hope? You all do. Every single one of us. We talked about this last week as well. Your heart and my heart, it's like an idol factory. It'll not stay idle. It'll continue to work, continue to suck up things like a vacuum cleaner with a powerful engine, and you try to fill your heart. Don't you do that? You do that, right? That's why you want things, and you want the better things. Or you want the best things, not just one, not just two, but as many as you can. But the amazing thing is, it doesn't matter how many things you get, you cannot fill your heart. You know why? Because your heart, the capacity is infinite. God 
has set eternity in the hearts of men. You cannot, you will not be satisfied with bags, electronics. It will not. Not even a husband. Not even a husband. Okay? That's just the way it is. So where do I put my hope? Can I just ask you, where do you put your hope? Okay? Because you do. You do. You all. That's by nature, instinct. You put your hope on something or someone. Okay? I could give you some options, but Babel, uh, Babel, Bible, did I say Babel? Bible. <laughs> Bible gives you two main options. Okay? One is humanistic origin. Whatever you could accomplish. Your effort, your business, your degree, your strength, your horse. We're going to look at that in the verse. Something you, f- you, you created. And the second option, the biblical option and the better option is God origin. God is the hope. Okay? Those are the two options. If you put your hope in Him, uh, you're not going to be trusting in these things. If you put your hope in things, or what you could fabricate, God is not your hope. Okay, so that's the first question. And uh, first verse, there are many ways, maybe I prepared too many verses today. I'm being very optimistic. So I prepare a lot of verses. Let me start with Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesian gospel, Christ and the church, if you understand the gospel. Listen to what Paul is saying to Ephesian church. Remember that. You are at the time separated from Christ. That's not a good thing. Separated from Christ. And he repeats, same thing, alienated from the commonwealth of of Israel. You're not Israel people, God's people. Okay? One more time, strangers to the covenant of promise. All means same thing. You are separated from Christ. Having no hope and no God in this world. And this is what I wanted to share. Gospel position, no hope, no God. No God, no hope, I should say it that way. If you you don't have God, you have no hope. At least hope that will last. Okay? Biblical position. Right? But now, the gospel is, in Christ, Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought nearby. The blessing, right? Instead of being cursed, now you brought to blessing through the blood of Christ. Okay? This is Christianity. This is the gospel. It's not you do more for the Lord and you get more blessing. That's not Christianity. That's idolatry. Straight up. The gospel is we were separated, and rightly so, we were alienated, right? And we were strangers. No hope, no God. That's who you are. But if you are in Christ, through His blood, now you have hope. Okay? You have hope. Okay? Christ, uh, Christianity. Now, today's passage is an incredible psalm. If you get a chance, I ask you to go home and read it. I, I uh, read this verse Many times during this week, this past week, it's an incredible psalm, and there is a logic to it. Can I just tell you, hope, biblical hope, is not illogical. It's logical. What do you mean? How could hope be logical? It's logical because you put your hope upon someone you could trust. Can I just ask you, will you put your hope on someone that you cannot trust? Someone comes to you, Okay, someone you do not know, maybe you, you do know this person, and this person is not very sincere. He's not very reliable, and he's a, he's a player. And he said, hey, uh, hey, Jennifer, I, I love you. Can I marry you? I'll be on your side for the rest of my life, rest of your life. Will you marry me? Will you trust him? Of course not. It doesn't matter what the person says. It's the per- who that person is. Does that make sense? It's not illogical. Hope is not illogical. Hope is very logical. It has to be someone 
His word and his action has to match. And his character has to be real. Right? If that person is a sly liar, oh, Jennifer, I'm, I, I'm not thinking of anyone, right? Don't, don't get, Jennifer, please marry me. I love you. I'm going uh, to be next to you, right? Until, until I die, I'm going to be faithful to you. But you know this person hasn't been faithful. Will you trust him? Will you put your trust and hope in him? You better not, right? You wouldn't. Instinctively, you wouldn't. You know what hope is about? Danger. Danger. You fear the future because you feel the danger coming. You, do, you feel the danger of losing. You feel the danger of being separated. You feel the danger of humiliated, shamed. Just think about it. Right? But you could have safety, security, in hope, in the person whom is trustworthy. Okay? It is very logical. Let me read it to you. It begins with an introduction of Psalmist basically saying, Shout and worship. Shout for joy in the Lord. For you righteous, praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre. Make melody to Him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. And here we go. Pay attention, okay? Here's the message about hope. For the word of the Lord is upright. Word of the Lord is true. His word is true. Are you true? Am I true? I try to be, but a lot of times I can't because I can't. Right? But Lord... Word of the Lord is true, upright. And His work is done in faithfulness. Remember? It has to be not just the word, it has to be the action. But His word and His action is faithful. He's consistent. Are you consistent? Am I consistent? A lot of times we're not. But He is. In fact, so much so that the Bible calls Him, He's not, He's saying yesterday, today, and forever. Immutable. Immutability unchanging nature of God. That's why you could trust Him and not worry about it. Oh, maybe He will respond this way. Maybe He will respond the other way. Then you can't really put your trust in Him. But God is upright and He's faithful. Very logical if you think about it. It does not stop there, right? What if that person is a bad person, right? And He speaks about the character of God. God, the Lord, he loves righteousness and justice. How do you like that? He loves righteousness and justice. He's not a sly God for his own interest. He will abuse you and manipulate you and just disown you. He's righteous and justice. Not only that, there's one more great quality. It doesn't matter how powerful he is. It doesn't matter what he says. It doesn't matter what his track records are. But what is his relationship with you? If he doesn't care for you, it doesn't mean anything. But look at this. The earth is full of steadfast love of the Lord. Not only he is, you know, he loves justice, but he's full of mercy. Great mercy. Isn't that great? People, listen to me. If you want your heart to, heart to be changed, you need to know this God. If you want any hope in your marriage, you need to understand this God. This God needs to be transforming your heart. And that's exactly what He wants to do. His word and His action and His character, they all come together very very logical. And then he explains why you could put your hope in him. Okay? By the word, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a hip, and he put deep in the storehouse. What is he saying? Through his word. He's not just saying any words. Through his word, the whole world came into being. In other words, his word is so trustworthy. When he says there's a hope for your future, you could bet, you could put your money on it, your life on it. That's what it means. 
is the creator. Not only that, verse 8, what else is he? Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Why? Why? For he spoke the word and it came to be. He spoke and he came to be. He commands and he stood firm. And the second quality, and that Lord brings counsel of the nations. Russia, United States of America, China, the counsel of the nations, plans, purpose, hidden purposes. We all have that. And what does it say? He will bring counsel of the nations to nothing. Okay? And he frustrates the plans of the people. On the other hand, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. Do you hear it, people? Is this person worthy to put your trust and hope? That's what the scripture is speaking to you. Right? Is this person worthy? Come on, be logical. Okay, wake up. Be logical. It's not illogical. Hope, biblical hope is very, very logical. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, and the plans of his heart. Lord's heart to all generations. Future is in his hand. Future is in his hand. Your children, children's children, is in his hand. And then, the, and then he goes on, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed are you if God is your Lord. Blessed are you if God is your Lord. And the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. And look at this. Lord looks down from heaven. He looks down. And he sees you. He sees you in fear right now. He sees you in anxiety right now. He sees you trembling right now. Right? Look, looks down from heaven. And he sees all the children of men. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions... The hearts of them all observes all their deeds. He's watching your deeds, every single deed. Every single deed. We should fear him. Right now, he's watching you. Look up, up here. Yeah. He's watching you. Every single deed. He's the maker and he's sovereign. And he's watching you with justice and his steadfast love. Right? The king's, the, the, this is the punchline. The king is not saved by his great army. Okay? You think all these hydrogen bombs will save you? You think all these still plane will save you? It's not going to save you. Scripture makes it very clear. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is false hope. Hydrogen bomb is a false hope. Makes it very clear. It's, he's going to frustrate the plans and the counsels of the nations. Okay, I, know, I don't know whether you pay attention to these things and kind of makes you uncomfortable you hear about North Korea every single week these days Trump and mr. mr. Kim tweeting each other and I thought stupid you could do that a lot of people are genuinely uncomfortable about things like that I'm uncomfortable honestly but here's the word here's the word of God the war horse is false hope for your salvation and by its great might it cannot rescue you. then what is the true hope Psalm 33 right what's the true hope behold the eyes of the Lord and on those who fear him okay and those who hope in his steadfast love right? the true hope 
is this steadfast love of the Lord towards you. Right? That he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. In- interesting expression. Did you know that in Hebrew word, there's no word for hope? There's no word. In English word, we have H-O-P-E, hope. But in Hebrew words, there is no specific word for hope. Instead, there are different nuances, expressions, and one of them being, wait upon the Lord. Can you imagine this? You're in trouble, and you wait upon the Lord. That's hope. It's an interesting expression. And right away, the passage that comes to my mind is from Isaiah chapter 40, you know? Even the young man gets weary, right? But he who waits upon the Lord shall renew his strength and will soar up like an eagle. Do you remember that passage? That's put your hope upon the person of God, the Lord and his steadfast love. Are you hopeful? Why not? Where is your hope? Right? Where is your hope? For our heart is glad in Him because we trust in His holy name. Let our steadfast love, okay, has said love, His great mercy, O Lord, be upon us as we hope in You. Okay, that's Psalm 33. Okay, and we jump right into New Testament, and I want to introduce the. This sums up the entire gospel, actually. I, I use that expression a lot, but this is really true. Some of the entire gospel according to Peter. Okay? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, has said, steadfast love. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. This is loaded. Can I just explain this? Okay? If you could just stay with me. Everything is according to His counsel. According to His great mercy. His hesed, steadfast love, loving kindness. Okay? He caused you, in other words, it's His work, to be born again. Remember we talked about this? Salvation is not your work. You can't. You don't have the desire. If you have any desire, you want to rebel against Him. That's why it has to be irresistible grace. Because we are so dumb, human beings. If we could resist His grace, we're going to resist it. It has to be irresistible. He caused us. He placed that hope. He placed that faith, saving faith in me. That's right. I cannot trust on things got to put my hope in Him. Saving faith. Saving love. Saving affection. Do you have it? I'm not taunting you. Do you have it? Either you have it or you don't have it. He causes to be born again into a spatial sense of a living hope. Can you imagine this sanctuary? Once you walk, uh, you know, walk in here, just like Noah's Ark, you're saved. You are placed into a space called living hope. And He caused it. Are you in living hope? Is hope in you living? I'm sharing this because I'm praying that the Spirit of God will stir you because a lot of people, you don't have it, and you try to convince yourself you can't have it. When you don't have it. When you don't have it, you don't have it. Right? So he caused us to be born again to a, into a living hope through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the ultimate fulfillment of his promise. What's, the, what's one thing that you cannot really resolve uh, 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 by yourself about the future? There are many things, but among other things, what happens after I die? What really happens after I die? Do you, can you resolve it? Can you come to a, some sort of a peace about that? Apart from Christ and, and, and Jesus? Can you? 
A lot of atheists say, I go back to ashes. And I told you this story many times when I went to London last year. This professor who just came back from one year of chemotherapy to uh, this cancer that he had. And I just was praying for him. It was a cafeteria of Kingston College in London. And I approached him and I said, can I sit down? Can I sit down in English accent, right? He says, yeah, please. And then I began to talk to him and he knew who I was. Right away he said, he, would, he was, he was kind of courteous. And basically he said, as soon as I'm done, like, he wouldn't let me talk for a long time, maybe one or two minutes. He said, see that little bug? It lives its, its course of life. One week, you see that butterfly? It lives. When it dies, it's go, it goes back to the ashes. Ashes to ash, and that's it. Do you feel comfortable with that? Are you okay with that? Do you feel hopeful about that when you say that? How could you possibly be hopeful? You go into ashes and you feel hopeful? Can you resolve that? Can anyone resolve that? And if you are true to yourself, you can't. And you know why you can't? Because you are made to live for eternity. That's why you can't. You know you do. You know deep inside you do. But you can't resolve it logically up here. Because you can't. Because you know right here, you're going to live forever, but you don't have a, a solution to that. What happens? You feel the threat. You feel the danger. Only way to get out of that threat and danger is just kind of ignore it and brush it off. Can you do that? Is it safe to do that? Is it worth doing that? Can you play a chance? Can you take a chance upon your eternity? You can't. You can't. If you do, you're a fool, Bible says. That's why Bible says, fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's why the Bible says, fool says in his heart, there is no God. What do you think? Resurrection. How are you going to resolve that? Okay. It's a historical fact. There are many proofs. Historians, legal system, see that as a historical document. He, they researched much more than we did. You and I all combined. And they say, wow, there's a credible reliability upon this historic death and resurrection of person of Jesus Christ. How are you going to resolve that? Right? And if we continue to put our faith in things and you tremble and your anxiety, look at you. Why are you so downcast? Right? Bible says, yeah, this is a summary. It's His great mercy. That's the plan. That's the grand theme of Christianity. It's from God and it's His mercy, His steadfast love, His asset. He caused us to be born again. We can't do it. It's boring to you. It's frustrating to you. You can't love Him because you don't have that saving love in you. If you don't, you don't. Don't try to fight me. You should speak to him. Because the Bible says, ask it to be given unto you. He desires all of you to be saved. To you? Now, the paradox of all of this is you don't. You don't even want to do that. You know why? Because of a little treasure that I have here in this world. I might lose it. That's your fear. Right? But incredibly, you're born into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ into an inheritance. And you know, we have dividend or the promise, something that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, store for us if you are in Christ Jesus. And yet you hold on to these little things. You don't know when you're going to lose it. That's why you're so anxious. You're so tied up. If in Christ, 
if we hope in this life only, we are of, of the, all, all people most to be pitied. This is Christianity. If it's all about this present world, it doesn't make any sense. But he is saying, he's arguing, he's rhetorically asking, it's not just about this world, but it's about eternity. We have, we have hope in eternity. Right? I'm going to skip some of these because I, I think I prepared too much. Okay? What happens when you become a hopeful person? Okay, when you understand the gospel, Romans chapter 12, uh, Paul speaks about, after speak, uh, explaining the gospel from chapter 1 to chapter 11, chapter 12 is about, therefore, offer your life as a living sacrifice. This is how you need to live. And come down to verse 11. Listen to this. There's a logic to this. Okay? If you understand the gospel, do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Okay? And the next verse says, rejoice in hope. And be patient in tribulation and be constant in prayer. And then contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. If you just read it, uh, just kind of like through, it feels like a whole bunch of stuff that is unrelated, but there is uh, a logic to this. If you notice, hope is surrounded by serving and sharing with other people. Bible in the New Testament, when you understand the gospel and hope, it's always connected to other people and, and sharing. Remember we shared about this last week? If you like Louis Vuitton, you just don't want one. You want two, three, four, five. Still you are craving for more. You are a slave to materials. But when the gospel sets you free, you know what happens? You, you give and you share to the need of other people. It's, it sets you free. Here's, here's what happens. If you are, if you love the world, things of, 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 of this world, riches of this world, how many of you want to be really rich for other people? There is no one that I know. I really want to be rich for other people so that I could really give to other people and really share and apart from me. In other words, riches, love of the world, inherently makes you selfish. Inherently makes you selfish. How many of you want to have a Louis Vuitton, five of them, for some of the other people? It's all for you. Isn't it? Isn't it kind of pathetic? Just think about, think about the person. Isn't it kind of pathetic? You can't, even, you can't even afford one, and you have five of them. Material things and love of, th love of things makes you a slave to yourself, inherently selfish. Therefore, you cannot care for other people. Gospel sets you free from materialism. Therefore, other people you begin to see. Do you see the difference? Please lift up, lift up your heads. I don't know why your head is going down right now. This is an exciting time. This is what the Christianity is about. This is what Christianity is about, people. You want to be rich? For whom? For whom? For other people? So that you could really live out the gospel? Is that why you want to be rich? No. You're a slave to yourself. Makes you more and more slave to yourself. Okay? There's a logic to it. I want to read this again. I read this a couple weeks ago. For riches in, the, in this world, rich people in this world, please listen. Charge them not to be haughty or conceited, for not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Do you know whatever you have is uncertain? Can I just give you a scenario? I know it's not a pretty scenario. You may have $1 billion. Let's say you are stricken with cancer today. What is that going to mean to you? What is that going to mean to you? Nothing. Nothing. Right? Don't be conceited. Set your hope on uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And there are, and you know why? We should, we should you know, work hard so that we could do good. Be rich 
in good works. What is that? Be generous and ready to share. Storing up, by doing so, you're storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. You know why hope is good? Because you will begin to share with others now. You live like a human being instead of to all to yourself. How many of you are frustrated because things don't go in your way and you're trying to do this for the Lord? Perhaps your heart needs to come back to the Lord first. I think that's maybe the sign. Lord, want your heart to come back first. My heart to come back first. If I be rich, then I'll come back to you? You think God is a stupid fool? That you could kind of, you know, play around like that? You can't. You can't. Corey Tamboom. who is a uh, survivor of World War II as a Jewish woman. She, she was not a Jewish woman. Her sister was killed, right? Saved a lot of people. She said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. You put your hope in Him, You're not going to be fearful. You're not going to be fearful. You know why you're fearful? Last one. Why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. We're beginning a new year, okay? We're beginning a new year. Maybe you're a slave to your own selfishness. Leave you alone. All of us will go toward that direction. Every single one of us. But that's not the work of Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit always kind of counsels you, convicts you. No, no, no. No, 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 Paul. That's not good. That's not good. And I, okay, Lord, okay. I turn, turn around, and I want to be obedient unto you. I love this psalm because, listen, look at this psalm. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Who's, who's doing the talking? Who is he speaking to? O oh my soul. I'm speaking to my soul. Why are you so downcast, O oh, my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Do you like that when you're in turmoil? Of course not. And you try to get out of bed, get out of your bed and you don't have any energy. Why? And then... The biblical author speaks to his own soul, hope in God, for I shall again praise him. He's like saying to himself, I'm going to praise him again. I'm going to place my hope in him, and I'm going I'm to, you know, praise him again, my salvation and my God. Okay. Brothers and sisters, please listen to me. This is year 2018 beginning, and it'll definitely come to an end. It will. With or without you, it'll come to an end. Sorry, but it, it will. And the future is uncertain, but God has the future. Right? And it's not just anybody. He is reliable. He proved it. How? Death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through His Spirit. He's not just anybody who has no relationship with you, but he has such hesed and steadfast love towards you. I don't know why, but he does. He does. And that's my hope. That's what I bank on. You know why I'm so confident this year? If you see any confidence in me, not because we're doing so much 
No, no, not that. Because God put that hope in me. Something that I cannot fabricate. Okay. No God, no hope. But in Christ, He brought you near. Okay. If you continue to love the world, inherent selfishness will follow. Right? And you are blind to everyone else. But if you see the gospel according to his great mercy, he causes, us to be, causes you to be born again into a living hope, into an imperishable, undefiled, unfading inheritance, you will begin to look others and begin to share and give. And we live like God's people. Okay? Let's pray.